Good evening. Welcome to Voice of, Voices of Experience series here at Daniels and the beautiful University of Denver. Uh, thanks for coming in from that beautiful afternoon to join us. My name is Dave Markowski. I'm a proud member of Daniels Executive MBA uh, cohort number 59. And uh, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to, on behalf of uh, Daniels College of Business, I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, the sponsors that make this possible. Uh, Voices of Experience is a free program offered, by the our, offered to our community that would not be possible without the generous financial support of these sponsors. U.S. Bank, CoBank, Grant Thornton, Enterprise Holdings, Financial Executives International, and the Daniels Executive and Professional MBA program. Thank you for supporting and making this possible. Tonight, we're very privileged to be joined by Dr. Doug Jackson. Dr. Jackson is the president and CEO of Project Cure, the largest provider of donated medical supplies and equipment to developing countries around the world. Project Cure was founded in 1987 right here in Colorado by Doug's father, Dr. James Jackson, who was working as an international uh, economic consultant for developing countries. During a trip to Brazil, James visited a clinic in the Brazilian highlands where he learned that patients were often turned away due to a lack of medical supplies. He made a promise to the clinic doctor that he'd return with supplies and he delivered in 30 days with $250,000 worth of donated medical supplies. In 1997, James Jackson's son, Dr. Doug Jackson, became CEO and president of uh, Project Cure. Under his leadership, Project Cure has expanded beyond its headquarters in Centennial, Colorado, to other cities across the US with large distribution warehouses in Arizona, Texas, in Tennessee. In addition, Project Cure has established smaller collection centers in several other states and now collects medical donations in 15 cities in the U.S. and they've shipped nearly a billion dollars worth of medical supplies to over 130 countries. Doug Jackson graduated magna cum laude from Northwest Nazarene University, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree in Business Administration. He earned a JD at the University of Colorado in Boulder, receiving a, the uh, American Jew, Jewish, Jewish <laughs> Jurisprudence <laughs> Award for Excellence in the Study of Law. He later returned to CU and was awarded a PhD in Business Administration with an emphasis in finance authoring dissertation on leveraged buyouts and secondary public offerings. In addition to his work at Project Cure, Dr. Jackson has taught at the university level in the disciplines of finance, investments, leadership development, legal, and inter international issues. Dr. Dr. Jackson is a Rotary International Paul Harris Fellow and was the president of the Denver Rotary Club number 31. He serves on the board of directors for Interaction, World Denver, the Nanda Center for International and Comparative Law at the University of Denver, and the Rupert Hartman College for Health Professionals at Regis University. Dr. Jackson received the Lifetime Achievement Award in Healthcare from the American Red Cross, the 5280 Magazine Philanthropist of the Year Award, and accepted the COBIZ Best Places to Work and Colorado Ethics and Business Award on behalf of the team at Project Cure. I had the privilege of working with the Jacksons, both uh, uh, Doug and his father James, on a pro in Project Cure as part of my executive MBA cohort, developed a s social capital project around the delivery of a container of medical supplies to a clinic in Vietnam. We got to witness the passion and the impact of their work firsthand as we raised money and awareness in the community, loaded every last cubic foot 
of that shipping container and ultimately saw the faces and shook the hands of the hospital staff in Vietnam. We were delivering hope. He has turned what started as a single promise in 1987 into one of the most impactful organizations in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Doug Jackson. Wow, you look great. You know, everybody always says to take your phones out and turn them off. I'm going to ask you to turn yours on. If there's something that you hear tonight that you want to tweet about, do that. If you like something and you want to send it out on email, that's okay too. If you don't like it, send that out anyway because you're going to, by the time you're done with the evening, anyhow, just get it over with. So what are you willing to trade your life for? That's a question that we don't really like to ask because it makes us think about the end of things, right? What are you willing to trade your life for? That's a question, though, that we answer every day. My dad answered that question with the word money. When he was a young kid, growing up in a little town called Nampa, Idaho, he decided that he wanted to be rich. And rich was defined as being a millionaire, and he decided that he was going to be a millionaire by the time he was 30. So you can't be a millionaire in Idaho. I think there was a law against that then. <laughs> <laughs> so he moved to Denver. And he came here and he got involved in cars first. And that was our car as a kid. Can you believe that? <laughs> the cool thing was, my brother who's sitting down here, we discovered that the back seat of that car actually went all the way back and you could pull the curtains shut. It was the neatest car. And dad would drag race people coming home from Sunday at church. He got into cars and then he got into a thing called Winter Park and another little place called Vale. And he missed his goal. He didn't become a millionaire by the time he was 30. He did it by the time he was 31. And that was still when a million dollars meant something. And then he did it again, and again, and again, and again. But he discovered something. He discovered that you can be rich and not happy. Daniel Pink talks about this in this book, Drive, with this notion that people don't work necessarily for money. They work for passion and purpose. Now, I want to put something parathetically in here right now. I was doing a talk similar to this, and there was somebody who, a uh, pretty wealthy guy here in Denver, and about halfway through the talk, he got up and he left, and I think he thought it was because I was a communist. <laughs> I'm the world's biggest capitalist. I think the system that we've got works, and it works well. I'm not saying that it's bad, to have money, I'm just saying that it's not gonna make you happy. Daniel Pink wasn't opposed to it, that's the rule book by which we play, it's just that if you're counting on that stuff to make you satisfied in your life, you're not gonna ever get there. And that's what my dad discovered back when my brother and I were kids. So he and my mom did the Bill Gates thing before Bill Gates, they started something that they called a foundation. They sat Jay and I down at the table one Saturday morning and they said, boys, we've started something called a foundation. What that means is that you have no inheritance. <laughs> we just gave all your money away. I was in high school. It didn't matter. I went to college. It mattered a whole lot. <laughs> and then my dad was stuck with this conundrum. Now that you've made that choice, the thing that Steve Covey talks about climbing the corporate ladder to figure out that your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall, right? The only thing cool about technology is we just get to climb the ladder faster. <laughs> now what do you do with your time? And so my dad started doing economic consulting. You see, one of those things about our portfolio of assets that we have, it's not just limited to the stuff that's in our pocket or the stuff to which we own keys for. It's not the tangible stuff that we have that's in our little portfolio of possessions. It's that Rolodex, all those people that you know. It's the lessons that you learn sometimes the hard way. 
It's the things that you can give to other people that may or may not cost you any money. And my dad had tons of that. He had all this experience about making money, and he knew that if he could do it, he could teach somebody else to do the same thing. So he started out in Zimbabwe when Mugabe had first become president. You know, he was a good guy before he was a bad guy. And he went to Zimbabwe, and he started teaching those people how to barter. It's the 1031 exchange, just like we do here with real estate. You can trade copper for corn, and that's what he was doing. And they asked him to come to Ecuador, and then they asked him to come to Brazil. And when he was working in Brazil, that's where he met this little interpreter. And her name is Lorena. And Lorena was a medical student, and she told my dad one day, she said, I would like you to come with me to this clinic where my mom and I, we volunteer on the weekends. And they went to this little place called Mesquite. It's outside of Rio. There's about 300,000 people who live in this little sort of favela area. And this Dr. Neves was trying to do health care in an old house. And my dad went in there. And all there was in that place was an old metal table and a box of re-rolled bandages. There was a pediatrics ward in the bedroom off to the right side and that pediatrics ward had a baby scale and some Walt Disney posters. And my dad looked at that guy and he says, how can you do medicine like this? And the guy said, well, 3,000% inflation. You're the economista. What am I supposed to do? And my dad said, well, if I could get some stuff donated. He said, I don't want to get it taken on the black market. He said, could you get it into the country? And the guy looked at my pop and he said, well, aren't you the man working with the president? <laughs> Maybe you can do that. And so my dad flew back to Brasilia and got a, an agreement signed by the president of Brazil that he could bring things into the country. Now, how's that for audacity, right? He got back to Denver and was telling this story to a group of his friends, and he says, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I just promised this doctor that I was going to help him, and where do you get more than a Band-Aid around here? And one of his buddies, another one of these guys with resources... Another one of these guys who was trying to answer that question, what are you willing to trade your life for? He said, well, gee, Jim, my partner Pete and I, we own a medical wholesale company. We'll give you stuff. Do you know they gave my dad $50,000 of the stuff right off the shelf? That was that picture that you saw in his old tan Dodge truck. He drove down to Pete and Greg's warehouse, and he picked all that stuff up in that truck. And they drove it up to Evergreen and put it in their garage. And they went down and they got another truckload and they put that in the garage. And while my dad's driving back and forth between his house in Evergreen and, and Greg and Pete's warehouse, they started calling on the phone. And Greg and Pete are saying, hey, you are in the wholesale business too. You could give some things. We did. And you know, in 30 days' time, they filled $250,000 of the stuff in that garage. Mom and dad wrote that check and sent that down to Brazil. And that's how this whole crazy thing got started. Be careful when you answer that question, what are you willing to trade your life for? Because the answer is probably going to take you on a road that you have no idea where that road leads when you start off. The good news is, it's going to be the best road you've ever taken. My folks are here tonight, by the way. <clears throat> My dad wrote a book about this whole thing, and it's called The Happiest Man in the World. My mom's here. If you want to know why my dad's so happy, you've got to meet my mom. He's going to be out there in the lobby, and he's got some of those books if you'd like to take some of those home for you. All the proceeds from that book go back to Project Cure, and that ships another box of medical supplies. And so uh, if you'd like to do that, we'd love to have you participate, and then you can see if I told the story right. So Daniel Pink talks about this, and he says, you know, here's the myth that we bought into in the United States. And the myth is, is that all this stuff is what life is all about. All this money that we think will manipulate people is what turns the cranks. And he did enough study to find out that, you know what, that's not true. That's not true. There's something called the marginal rate of satiation. If you guys are taking econ right now, you know what that means. 
All it means is, is that the first bite of pizza is a lot better than the last bite of pizza. It means the stuff that we get, we get tired of pretty quick. I've got a daughter, her name is Caroline, she's 12. <clears throat> Caroline, at 12, thinks she's poor. She lives in Columbine Country Club with her mom, she is not poor. <laughs> but Caroline thinks she is, and so she gets these excitement things over stuff like $20 bills. If I tell Caroline, here's a $20 bill, and you could plot that on a curve with happiness on one axis and dollars on the other axis, if we give Caroline an increment of 20 bucks, her little happiness scale goes right straight up. If I give her another installment of $20, her happiness scale is pretty steep, but it's not as steep as the first $20. And on and on and on it goes, and our curve goes up like this, and then it sort of levels off. And so when Donald Trump is driving down there on Central Park and he sees a $20 bill blow across in front of the limousine, he's not even going to get out of the car to get it. Because it doesn't bring him enough happiness to pick up that $20 bill to make it worth his time to do it. And here's what Daniel Pink said. That curve flattens out a lot faster than anybody thought. Caroline is not very happy, and it doesn't take her a whole lot of time to get there. That last bite of pizza really doesn't taste all that great. So what? So you know what does count? Passion and purpose. What does count is what Simon Sinek talked about, why. We've got to get back to the why. Why? And that, probably more than anything else, is what this experiment called Project Cure stands for. There is a why. And that why looks like 17,000 volunteers who show up every year to work in our warehouses to help with this effort. The why looks like saving the lives of millions and millions of people all over the world who the only difference between them and us is the fact that we got born here and they got born there. And they have nothing for health care there. And we have it in such abundance that we throw it in the garbage. How crazy is that? I've learned a few things about this question of passion and purpose. I've learned that this passion and purpose thing transcends continents and countries. And that there's people all over the world who also do things for passion and purpose. We went to Sierra Leone in Freetown... There's a big hospital there, and um, one of the things that makes Project Cure really unique is the fact that we do a needs assessment before we ever ship anything. What that means is, is that somebody gets on an airplane, and we go to the hospital, and we look at it before we put a container of medical supplies in there. Now, I think you all understand, a container is a semi-truck trailer, right? Sometimes I go talk at, like, rotary clubs, and I love rotary. But they'll ask a question and they'll say, I like these containers. How many of these containers could I pick up and put in the back of my Suburban? <laughs> you put two and a half Suburbans in a container. <laughs> it's a big, big thing. And do you know there's $450,000 worth of stuff inside that container? Almost a half a million dollars on average. Before we ever ship that, we always go to that location by invitation and ask those people, what exactly is it that you need? We're looking for the three C's. We're looking for character. Do you really trust these people? Our average client will work for 12 hours in a day and they make a dollar. Do you know there's 1.2 billion with a B billion people in the world who work for a dollar a day? That's just crazy, isn't it? If you put a half a million dollars worth of stuff into a community and you don't trust them, you turn everybody into thieves. Wouldn't we like to know that before we do it? So we're looking for character, we're looking for capacity. If we put an x-ray machine in, do they have electricity? Can they power that x-ray machine? Is there somebody there who can fix it? And then we're looking for customs. Can we actually get this into the country without getting it taken? So we go do these needs assessments. Well, I got invited to Sierra Leone to go do a needs assessment at a big place called the Ola Doring Hospital. 
There's a Princess Christina Hospital that takes care of mommies, and the Ola During Hospital that takes care of little kids. And we walked into this big room, it's a conference room, and we're getting ready, I'm getting my notes out, my camera. People are coming in, and I walked over and I introduced myself to, um, to this young woman. I said, I'm Doug Jackson, I'm with Project Cure. She says, I'm Dr. Mustafa. I said, it's nice to meet you. I said, what's your role here? She said, I am the medical director for this hospital. Now, she was young. And I said, well, that's interesting. How long have you been medical director here? And she said, oh, maybe like a year and a half. I said, oh, what did you do before? And she said, well, actually, she said, I'm, I'm, I'm a student. She said, I'm what you and your country would call a resident. Now I'm really intrigued. <laughs> How many residents do you know that are running an entire hospital? I said, what happened to your attending? She said, well, he got a job in France and he left. And I said, so you're staying here running the hospital? And she said, yeah. Me and a couple of my friends. Well, we sat down and we did that needs assessment. We started out with the easy questions, and those are things like, so how many beds are here? How many doctors are here? How many of your doctors are surgeons, and what's your birth rate? How many babies did you deliver here last year? What's your cesarean rate? And then we get into the specifics. Let's start with the emergency room. Do you need gloves? Do you need a defibrillator? Let's go to the delivery room. Do you need an incubator? And she perked up. She said, yeah, we need an incubator. I said, well, tell me about the one that you have. She said, well, we have two. And one of them kind of doesn't work. This is the top pediatric referral hospital in the entire country. And I said, well, when we're done, doctor, would you take me and show me the incubators that you have? And she said she would. So we started walking through that hospital, and we walked down the hallway and into this big room. It's probably as big as the first level here. And here was all these kids, sick kids. And they had cribs over here, and the moms sleep in the crib with the kid because there's no place for mom to sleep if she doesn't sleep in there. So about half of these cribs are broken because cribs aren't made to have mom sleep in cribs. And sure enough, here was one incubator, and there was a little kiddo in there. Now, the lights don't work. The heat doesn't work, so they put a light bulb on top of the incubator shining into this thing. There's no oxygen, but there's a baby in there. The other one had the whole group of doctors and nurses kind of standing around there, and they had an ambo bag, and they're trying to get this little baby to breathe. And we walked over there, and I'm watching as they're doing this little ambo bag. And that little kid's chest would go up and down, up and down. They take the bag off, it's just settle. And Dr. Mustafa said, so how long have you been doing this? And the nurse said, about 45 minutes. And she said, it's time to stop. And that was when it was my time to go stand outside because she had a tough conversation with the mom coming up. And I went out and I stood in the parking lot a little bit and she comes out after a while. And the first thing she said to me was, she said, I am so, so, so sorry. And I said, for what? And big tears started rolling down her face, and she says, I'm sorry for what you saw, because this is so difficult. I can't imagine you'd want to come back here again. And I looked at her, and I said, Dr. Mustafa, this is the first place we're coming back, largely because of you. That young doctor could go anywhere in the world and practice medicine. She could be on the next plane to France, following her resident. But she understood that people work for passion and purpose. Amazing. And in probably the biggest vote of confidence that any doctor could have, Dr. Mustafa had a baby in that hospital and she stayed. Unbelievable. People work for passion and purpose. This law transcends continents and countries. It transcends age groups. Little kids get excited about doing this. 
passion and purpose thing. We started a program that we called Kits for Kids. This was because in a lot of places around the world, there are not Walmarts and Walgreens and King Supers and Safeway and all the rest of those. And there are little kids who get fever. And the fever spikes up and then they get mitral valve failure, damage in their heart because their fever goes over 104, 105 degrees and mom can't go down and buy Tylenol, right? Little kids get infected knees because they stumble and they fall and they skin their knee and there's no place to go down and get a Band-Aid and Neosporin. So we came back and sort of copied Franklin Graham's Operation Christmas Child idea a little bit. We created a deli box and we printed this list of the top 20 things that every mommy needs under her sink or in her kitchen cabinet to take care of her kids. Tylenol, Neosporin, all the easy stuff, right? Well, We did that for a while in a box, and then we decided that not any mom in the world ever needs one more piece of cardboard in her house. And so we were standing on the soccer field one afternoon, and I started watching these little girls, and they were all carrying nylon drawstring soccer bags, something like this. And I thought, that's it. Let's do that. So we started putting a list of those 20 things on this soccer bag. If you brought these tonight... We're going to give away some tickets for a a lacrosse game. But that's what this is all about. And we started going out to places like schools and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. And we discovered that little kids at the age of six and seven and eight understand what passion and purpose means. We just did a thing at Christmas over at the Children's Hospital. We had about 600 little Girl Scouts come between Christmas and New Year's. And it is the noisiest group of little girls you've ever seen in your life. But man, are they cute. And they are so fun. And they brought all of this stuff with them. And they were so excited about the idea that they could help some other kids. We had a conversation in this big room in Children's Hospital with all these little kids. And it went something like this. Hey, girls, what do you do whenever you fall down and you skin your knee? Hand goes up. Good. What? We put a Band-Aid on it. Absolutely. What else do you do? Well, you put the Bernie Fizzy stuff on there. That's good. What else do you do? Well, you put the Neosporin on there. Great. What if you don't have Neosporin? We go to Target. (laughs) Good. What if there's no Target? My mom shops the King Supers. (laughs) Great. So there's no King Supers. There's no Target. Let me just make this easy. There's no Walmart. There's no store, girls. What do you do? Big, blank stare. What do you mean there's no store? So here's what we're going to do today, girls. We're going to take all that stuff that those kids need, and we're going to pack it in these bags, and you're going to write a note on it. And you're going to tell those little kids over there in Peru, Colombia, Africa, that you hope that they get better, that you help, hope that they get well, that you love them. Man, those little girls went down. They packed, what, Jan, thousands of these things? 1,700 of these bags. They were the happiest little Girl Scouts in town because they get it. Passion and purpose. So how do you do that? How do you find passion and purpose in your life? This is what Simon Sinek talked about when he said start with why. The why for us looks a whole lot like Dr. Mustafa. It looks like a lot of places around the world where moms aren't making it because they don't have simple things like suture. And we can fix that problem. That's the why. You've got to answer the why in your life. You've got to come back and say, you know what? This is the passion and purpose in my life. This is why we do what we do. We've got 17,000 people every year that come to Project Here and say, that's a why. And that would be great. And if you want to come down and do that with us, we would love to have you. But I'm smart enough to know that that may not be the reason that you get out of bed every morning. That reason might be for you what you get to do every day. 
You might get to go to work and do something that is so meaningful to you that that ignites your passion and your purpose. I was in uh, O'Hare Airport not too long ago. Imagine that. <laughs> and there's this cool little gift shop on Concourse B, and it's called Hoi Polloi. I just stumbled in there one afternoon, and I started looking around, and I thought, man, this is the coolest, craziest, most whimsical little place. And so every time I get a layover at O'Hare, I just walk in there. There's fun little cufflinks, and there's art, and there's those stopper things you put in the top of your wine bottle that's got all kinds of crazy stuff on there, and sometimes the thing spins and all of this, and I thought, man, this is like a magical little enclave in the middle of O'Hare Airport. Well, I went there this last time, and I'm walking around, and this guy comes up to me. He's a handsome-looking Asian guy, and, and he comes up, and he says, can I help you find anything? I said, no, but this, you got the coolest store. I said, how long have you worked here? And he said, well, he said, uh, since it started, actually. And he pulls out his card, and his name is Ron Hoy. And I said, oh, Hoy, like Hoy Polloi, I get it. This is your store. He said, yes. And I said, tell me about it. He said, I decided to start a store in the happiest place on earth. And I said, O'Hare Airport? <laughs> he said, no, we started our first store in the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World. If you're ever there, come by. He said, I'd love to give you a tour. And I said, you really love this, don't you? And he said, this is my passion. I heard that word and I thought, oh my gosh, this is my passion. This is what keeps him going. And we've got that lesson over and over and over, don't we? I stumbled on this theory a little bit, like, oops, this isn't working, when I came to fast food. Why would you do fast food? What's the passion and purpose? I went to Clinton Global Initiative when it was here in Denver not too long ago, and they had the guy on there who's the co-CEO of Chipotle. And he started talking about passion and purpose, and he said, you know, what we do is we like to hire people based on character. We want to find really good kids, and then we want to teach them how to run business. And so what we'd like to do is to get them started on the burrito line. You don't have to have an MBA. You don't even have to have gone to college. We're going to start you on the burrito line, and as you do well, we're going to promote you. And he said the last several of the executives that just got promoted were kids who started making burritos. That's what gets us excited, and the next guy is looking for the next guy, and the next guy, and the next guy, and this is a chain of success. That's what gets us up. Burritos just happen to be the means to the end. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? We start with the why. We start with the passion and the purpose. We have an opportunity to change the world when we do that. And that's one of the advantages. Project Cure changes the world all over the place. Little did I know whenever I was in Sierra Leone about what was going to hit that whole country and the mess that was created by this Ebola virus. We had gone up to a little place called Kenema. Kenema is a town clear up on the very, very north side of the country. I was traveling with a friend of mine, Don Osman. And we went up to Kenema to do the same needs assessment. Now the doctor that was in charge of that hospital was a little bit more proactive and what he had done was he sent an email and he said, what I really need in my hospital is I really need Eight beds with side rails. Now, had we not been doing the needs assessments, we would have probably sent the guy eight beds with side rails, and that's going to be perfectly fine, right? But we went ahead and we did that needs assessment, and when it was done, I took my camera, and I walked over to the doctor, and I said, let's walk around here, and let's take a look at all of the places that you need me to look at, because I'm going to take pictures of it to make sure that we send you the right things. Well, we walked into a big open room, and there was bed after bed after bed after bed after bed after bed. In the third world, there is no private room. And I was walking around there, and I looked at this doctor, and I said, hey, doc, stop for a second. I got a question for you. And he looked at me and said, okay. I said, where's your plug-in? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, in the United States, bed with side rails comes with electricity. 
You have to plug them in to make them work. You've got all manual beds. Before I send you electric beds, I want to know where you're going to plug these things in. He said, no, no, no. He said, the beds for here are manual. The beds that I need from you are going to go in maternity. I said, oh, you mean for like moms who are going to go have a baby? And they said, no, not for those moms. He said, we have a problem with eclampsia. And I said, I don't understand. He said, well, the moms don't come in here for prenatal checkup. So they get into eclampsia and they have eclamptic shock. And I said, well, explain to me how beds with side rails fix this problem. And so he started to explain this, that when a mom comes in and she's in eclamptic shock, she goes into something that looks like an epileptic seizure. And he says to me, we can't stop that problem here because moms won't come. The reason moms don't come to those hospitals is because everybody who goes to the hospital dies. And you can't tell the mom she ought to go for a prenatal checkup when everybody there that she knows doesn't come out of the hospital. Well, he's telling me the story, and we walk in through these big swinging double doors, and there's a mom from me to you, and she's in a bed, and she's in a clamptic shock, and she has a heart attack, and she dies right there. And he said, explain to me again then how the beds of side rails help solve that problem. And he said, well, we don't have a surgical suite either. And we don't have anesthesia. So when she goes into epileptic shock, we tie her arms and her legs to the sides of the bed and we try to do a cesarean. Now, my friends, this was not 1864. This was not in the middle of the Civil War. This was just about a year and a half or two years ago in Sierra Leone. What they really needed was a lab. What they really needed was an operating theater. What they really needed was an anesthesia machine. What he was asking for were beds of side rails. What happened in Sierra Leone happened because of Blood Diamond. If you saw the movie, for 11 years those people had a civil war. And that civil war absolutely destroyed everything in that country. The soldiers came through and they took some of it. The rebels came through, they took some of it. They destroyed the towers, the radio towers. They destroyed everything. Fast forward to about a year ago when this Ebola thing starts really heating up. And you can understand why that was kind of a Petri dish. Why was it that all of those people got sick? Why was it they couldn't control it? It was because they destroyed the infrastructure in that country. And when they really needed the gloves and the masks and the doctors and the nurses, they weren't there. That's the tough thing. In November, I picked up my New York Times and I started to read the front page and it was talking about Ebola. And what it said was that all the doctors and the nurses, remember the people I met when I was there? In Kenema had died because of the virus. That's tough stuff. The problem that we're not talking about is coming 18 months from now when mom goes in to have a baby and the doctors are gone, the nurses are gone, the hospital that they still have is contaminated. Mom really doesn't want to go to the hospital now. If that's not a why, I don't know what is. If passion and purpose doesn't start with changing the world for people in places like Sierra Leone, I don't know what will. And that's why we do what we do every day. And that's why I want to talk to you about finding your passion and purpose, because it may not be medical supplies for you. It may be something so completely different, but so completely compelling to you, that it takes over the mainspring of your life and you go out to change the world. That's what this really is all about. I had this crazy thought and part of the excitement that I had in coming tonight to share with you was not just about Project Cure, but about this nutty notion that what if in one place and one time in the whole history of ever, we were able to have a country and nation where all of us got to pick passion and purpose. What would that look like? 
I told you I was a raving fan of capitalism. The only reason we get to have this conversation is because we live in the country that we do. And we have worked so hard and created so many resources that we get options. My granddad, my mom's dad, was a rancher in Idaho. He raised cows. You know why? Because his dad was a rancher. And when grandpa died, he left the farm to Uncle Roger. I got another buddy of mine. We went to high school together. His dad was an engineer. He set all three boys down and he said, you guys need to be engineers. If you're in the eighth grade in France, they give you a test. And based on the results of that test, you get to go to the university or you get to go technical. We grew up in Evergreen. We didn't like to go to school in eighth grade. So sometimes we didn't. <laughs> a lot of times we didn't. <laughs> and it was a really great childhood. But I am so glad that I got the option to do whatever I wanted to do. I was in North Korea about a year ago. You live in North Korea, the little short guy gets to tell you exactly what you're going to do, and it's probably going to be planting rice. Not because you like planting rice, but because that's what you get to do. Because he told you. So what if we have a whole country like the United States of America where the greatest generation built on the next generation built on the next generation and we get the option to pick? Wouldn't that be unbelievable? We wouldn't all pick nonprofit. Please don't do that. You get to pick some other cool stuff. Some nut decided that my entire record collection should go on my telephone. And it should not have square edges. <laughs> Why? Because he could. Because it made him happy. Because it made him happy. I was doing a little lecture across the way at Daniel's, and this student came up to me, and she said, <clears throat> I want to have a conversation with you about this. She says, I'm a little bit nervous. She said, my parents are telling me I should be an accountant. And I really am not getting the call. And I said, what do you like to do? What gets you so excited in the morning that you jump out of bed and you say, man, I love this day? She said, I want to run kids' camps. And I said, awesome, do it. Well, my dad says I can't make any money at kids' camps. I said, do you know how much my friends are paying for summer camp? <laughs> are you kidding me? Fly your dad in on your new jet and have him visit your camp. If you love what you do, you're going to have the best kids camp in the entire universe. Because every day you get up and you're so excited, you're still going to have employee problems and all that stuff. But it's going to be okay because you get to do what is in your heart your biggest passion. I know we don't get to talk about heart and passion and things in business school very often. We should. I know you guys do here at DU and that's one of the things that makes this a really cool spot. Because you get to talk about doing this stuff. One of the things that comes out of that is this notion that I can trust you if I understand what your passion is. I can trust the fact that you and I are aligned. Edwin Papke wrote this great book called True Alignment. And he talks about in all of the things that we do, our marketing message, our customer service, our learning methods, our reward system, everything within the organization needs to be in alignment. And do you know where the alignment starts? Is with your passion. Why are you here? Are you here because you really love this job? One of my friends I count a very great privilege to know is David E. Bell. He's a justice on the Court of Appeals. We go to lunch together sometimes, and you know what he talks about? Law. Because he loves it. And that's why he is such a brilliant jurist is because he's doing the things that he loves the most and so will you now if you're an employer and you have a company and you have not connected the dots between what your people do every day and passion do it now go home tonight and write all the reasons why what you do changes the world and tomorrow morning get up and get all your employees together and have a conversation. We talk about that a lot in our shop. 
Our staff, we've only got 27 paid staff, 17,000 volunteers, and there's no difference between what motivates all of us. We go out into the field and we get to go look at these places together. We get to go on the trips where we unload the containers. We get to go see operating rooms where when we first did the needs assessment, they're operating on old clunky tables from the 1950s. And now they've got these state-of-the-art cool lights and the anesthesia. We get to see that. You talk about firing up passion. That's exciting stuff. And that happens all over this town. Whether you're selling burritos and watching those young kids come up when they don't have a chance, and now they do. Whether you're looking at the next court of appeals case that's going to determine to change the course of history in the United States. Whatever that is for you that fires your passion, that's what this whole conversation tonight is about. We just happened to do it in the third world with a bunch of medical equipment that somebody was going to throw in the garbage. But you'll answer that question for you. If I think that you're there because of the same reason that I'm there, I've got alignment and I can trust you. I got in a little fight with my auditor. That's not recommended. <laughs> he wanted to know about our inventory. We probably carry $20 million of inventory. We've got a warehouse in, here in Denver. We've got one in Phoenix, another one in Nashville, another one in Houston, Texas. We just opened one in Chicago. We're trying to talk the Dansko people into letting us open another one in Philadelphia, and I really hope that works. You know what I told them I wanted to do? I wanted to have them start doing bright red clogs. We'll start selling cure clogs. Do you think there's any nurses that would buy those? I think that'd be pretty fun. We've got all of this inventory and all these warehouses, and this auditor asked me, he said, so who stays at the warehouse? Who locks up and who opens up and who's in control of the inventory? And I said, well my team of volunteers are. He said, I know, but I mean, like, whenever at the end of the day you have to lock up, who's there? And I said, they are. I just told you that. <laughs> well, I know, but I mean, who's got the key to the warehouse? <laughs> There's a lockbox on the door. And guess who has the combination, Charlie? They do. <laughs> they can come and go anytime they want. He said, well, aren't you afraid that they're going to steal anything? No, because they're there for the same reason I'm there. I can totally trust those people because they're not going to steal the stuff. They know that the best place for that stuff is not in the warehouse, and it certainly isn't in the back of their station wagon. It's overseas someplace taking care of somebody else's life. I told him, I said, I'm probably more worried about homicide than I am theft. He said, oh, really? <laughs> Auditors kind of tune into that thing. I said, yeah, I'm afraid that if somebody steals stuff, the volunteers are going to find out about it, and they're going to put the body in the front of the container, and it's going to end up in Africa with Jimmy Hoffa somewhere. <laughs> because why? Because we're all on the same page. If we're having problems in our organization, the, probably the place to start looking is at the alignment part. Are you here for the same reason that I'm here? Because if the motivation is ego, if the motivation is, I'm here for passion, you're here for money, if the motivation is, I'm here to do this and you're here to do that, there's no alignment. We're going to have a problem someplace. And if we're having problems with the people we're working with, it's either you're out of alignment or they are. Either you're there for a different reason or they are. And the first step to success, whether you're talking about your business or your home, is this alignment around passion and purpose. What is the reason that I do what I do? You say, Doug, does this really work? Yep. We got involved in something called Saving Mothers Giving Life. It was a program that Hillary Clinton put together because... After AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis, the things that President George Bush addressed under his PEPFAR plan, the second leading cause of death in Africa was having babies. I told you, mom doesn't want to go do a prenatal checkup. She gets there. Do you know in Kenya, the women actually have to bring their own gloves? 
because the doctors don't have gloves. And if they don't have gloves, what they do is on their way walking, walking to the hospital, pregnant, to have a baby, they stop in the fence and they take out the trash bags that are blown in the fence and they bring those in. And those doctors deliver into a trash bag. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So what happened was Hillary said, well, let's try to fix that problem too. George Bush did a really great job over here. Let's try to fix this problem over there. So USAID and the government of Norway and some great people at Merck and Christy Turlington and the American Academy of Obstetrics and Project Cure came around this notion called Saving Mothers Giving Life. And we picked four of the worst places to have a baby in Uganda and four of the worst places to have a baby in Zambia, and we went to work. And you know what we found out? Some moms will not take a taxi cab to the hospital to have a baby because she didn't have cab fare. Doesn't surprise anybody, does it? So what Christy Turlington does is she's got this program called Every Mother Counts, and you probably saw her CD at Starbucks, and all the money she raises goes to cab vouchers. So when the cab driver drives up to the hospital, he can go get paid. Merck started putting programs together with the pharmaceuticals that they need to take care of mom when she comes in. The American Academy of Obstetrics started doing planning. Norway put a bunch of money into it. USAID got the CDC and PEPFAR and everybody else involved, and they start testing moms for AIDS and eclampsia and all this other stuff. Our great goal was in five years... Can you reduce maternal mortality in those eight districts for Uganda, for Zambia? Can you reduce maternal mortality in five years by 50%? One of those big, hairy, audacious goals. Do you know within one year we were able to reduce maternal mortality by 30%? In one year? It's because... (laughs) Thank you. It's because we got all aligned around this passion and purpose thing, and we said, there's a big why. Let's start saving the lives of moms in Africa. Let's see if we can create a model that actually starts to change the world. Now we're going to roll this thing out in Nigeria. Who knows how well that'll do? That's a whole different playground. But let's see if we can figure that out. We had another one of these. It was kind of a fun story. I was speaking at some conference in San Diego, and I was sitting down here on the front, and there was a man sitting next to me, and I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm Doug, and he said, I'm Dr. Belay. I said, why are you here? He said, I'm speaking. Oh, funny thing, me too. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, um, I run an organization in Ethiopia called the Children's Heart Fund of Ethiopia. And he said, I've got this big, hairy, audacious goal. He said, we have about 650,000 little kids every year who get strep throat. And there's no clinic, there's no Walmart, no Walgreens, no Target. And he said, so these little kids, about 100,000 of those little kids get rheumatic fever. He said, we lose about 20,000 little kids to heart disease every year because either a congenital heart defects or the consequences of untreated strep throat. He said, I've got this goal to build this hospital in Addis Ababa. He said, right now what we're doing is we're raising money to fly kids to Dubai, to Europe, to the United States to get free heart surgery. And when I asked him, I said, how's that going? He said, not very well. He said, I can do a couple hundred kids a year. And I said, what do you need? He said, I need an angiographic cath lab. (laughs) That's a piece of equipment that's about a million and a half dollars. And I said, well, I don't know that we ever really get those very often, but if we do, I'll give it to you. (laughs) Well, you know, I came back to Denver, and I was speaking at the Rotary Club in Boulder, and I told him this story. And a guy walks up to me afterwards, and he said, I work at the Boulder Community Hospital, and he said, we have an angiographic cath lab. I said, what? (laughs) He said, yeah, we'll give it to you. So we drove up there, and I walked into the control booth that looks like NASA and it's got these screens up here and here's some guy in there and and the doctors are working on him and you can see his heart and he's got this blockage and they put the stent up there and poof 
he's better, and they roll him on out there, and wow, that's amazing. So you got another one of these. He said, no, this is the one we're taking out. He said, it's four years old. We paid a million and a half dollars for it. We're going to chop it up into little pieces and throw it away, unless you guys want it. <laughs> Do you know those people paid $20,000 extra to have that thing taken apart bit by bit, put in a container? We shipped it off to Ethiopia. And we're saving about 2,000 lives. These little kids who didn't have a second chance. Does this passion and purpose thing work? Yeah. Well, I got a call one day, picked up the phone, and this guy introduces himself, and he says, my name is Michael Woku, and I'm with NBC Nightly News. And he said, we'd like to come out and do a story on Project Cure. And I said, no. I'm kidding. I said, yes. Of course I said yes. <laughs> So he flew out and he introduced, uh, interviewed me and he interviewed my dad. They threw all of my interview on the floor in the cutting room, so my dad got on there. He drove around on the forklift with some of our volunteers. He did this really cool story. And we were sitting back up in my office and he said, do you have a story that you're really proud of? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said... Um, what would that be? And I told him the same story I just told you guys about Dr. Belay and these little kids in Ethiopia and all of this stuff. And he said, do you have a number? I said, like, what kind of number? A number of kids? And, no, he said, a phone number. And I said, sure, for who? <laughs> and he said, for Dr. Belay. I said, you know he lives in Ethiopia, right? He said, yeah. Is he going to call him? He said, no, I'm going to go see him. <laughs> Don't ever lie to the NBC Nightly News. <laughs> <laughs> they will go there. They'll find out. So they went and they did this story. They flew all the way to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and they did this story about Project Cure. And it's one of those success stories that we can look at and we can say, you know what? If 17,000 people a year unite around a common passion and purpose, we can change things. We can change the world. If the people in your organization, in your family, in the places that you spend your time get excited about a common passion. You can change the world too. And if you don't believe me, we brought the video. You can roll this tape. Time now for our Making a Difference report. Tonight it's about things most of us take for granted at hospitals here in the United States. No matter what you think about health care, think of this. Clean syringes, sterile dressings in the operating room, basic heart monitoring equipment, proper surroundings and materials. All of it's so common here, we often have too much of it in the U.S. That's where a project saving lives on the other side of the world comes in. Our report tonight from NBC's Michael Oku. From an Ethiopian slum, this is the smile a little girl gives when she's been given a second chance to live. Five-year-old Tekwamesh Awai was born with a heart defect a pulmonary artery so narrow it obstructed normal blood flow. She didn't eat or sleep, her mother says. She was awfully sick. The condition kills thousands of children here every year. But doctors saved Tequimesh with the help of Ethiopia's only cardiac catheterization lab for children, a gift from an organization half a world away in a Denver suburb. When I first started Project Cure, you can imagine my learning curve. It's where Jim Jackson founded Project Cure, a nonprofit that collects surplus medical supplies from hospitals, and then sorts, tests, and ships those supplies to the poorest clinics and hospitals worldwide. Scrubs for Kenya, scanners for Cambodia. Jackson, a former economist, came up with the idea after witnessing squalor at a doctor's clinic in the Brazilian highlands. So he promised he'd return with donated supplies and he delivered. The director of the hospital um, said to me, you know what you really brought us? You brought us hope. Since its first shipment in 1987, Project Cure has sent medical supplies to 123 countries. This year alone, it plans on moving $40 million worth to 70 hospitals around the world. All with the help of donations and the time of 10,000 volunteers, including retired ER nurse Millie Truitt. When I touch things, I think, you know, who is this going to touch? Hey. Back in Ethiopia, where checkups now start with life-affirming hugs, 
Doctors estimate the lives of some 2,000 children a year will be saved by that cath lab alone. Now I play. I can do whatever I want, Tequimesh says. A little girl with a smile and a message across seas. Thank you. Michael Oku, NBC News, Centennial, Colorado. So what are you willing to give your life for? Something like that's worth it. Thanks for letting me be here tonight. It is really an honor to be with you. I'm such a fan of what goes on here at the University of Denver and uh, over here at the Business School and Corbell and places like that. And it's just an honor to have an organization like this in our community that believes so strongly in educating the next group of folks to come and pick up where our legacy leaves off. And uh, for me personally, it's just been a real treat to be with you. I think we've got a little bit of time for some question and answers. There we go. And as a professor, that's really good news. <laughs> that's great. On our way. Great. That was awkward. <laughs> um, I actually run a local charity here as well. And we we do consulting for small nonprofits. Yeah. Alignment is a big, big issue between board and founders. Do you have recommendations? Did you guys go through that? Working with other charities, do you have recommendations on what they can do? Because we have opinions as well as a small charity, sure. but as a really small charity, that's a really hard thing for founders to wrap their heads around. Anything, any insight on that? Um. That's a good question, and I hope that I understand what you're asking. Just the alignment overall. The alignment part. I think one of the things that um, I recognized about my role, and I think my dad does a really great job of it, is you become the chief storytelling officer for your organization. If you want to help people understand what that big, hairy, audacious goal is, what the passion, the purpose, why, Simon Sinek's question, right? Start with why. Then we've got to be able to articulate that in as good of a way as we possibly can so that everybody understands what it is that we do. I call it the five-year-old rule. When my 12-year-old Caroline, when she was five, I had her in the back seat of my car. She's all locked in the car seat. Her little buddy's next to her. And I hear her tell her friend, well, my daddy goes to the hospital and gets Band-Aids and sends them to kids in Africa. If a five-year-old kid can understand what we're doing, we probably are doing something right, right? Warren Buffett talked about this. He says, I don't buy stuff I don't understand. I understand Coca-Cola, not so big on the Enron thing, right? Now he looks like a genius. <laughs> so spend some time and craft that message so that everybody understands. And I think what will happen is, is that then your board, if they're not aligned, they're going to probably disalign themselves and say, you know what, that's not a passion and purpose that I'm interested in. I'll go do something different. Or they're going to say, oh, I really understand what it is that you guys do, and I'm willing to pour my resources and time and treasure and talent into that because I get excited about the vision. Uh, leadership, that's the number one thing that we do, right? We get to create vision and culture, and after that, manage cash, and that's about the end. Yeah. Yes, 